Uh, my name is David Karki. Um, I'm with SDSU Extension and work as agronomy field specialist. Um, but for the last, uh, last two years or so, um, I and my colleague, uh, Amanda Bachman out of Pierre Regional Center, um, are also co-coordinating um, CR efforts uh, in the state. And our next speaker, uh, Ryan Schmidt, who received a uh, partnership grant uh, from North Central SAIR. Uh, so our next speaker, Ryan, will share his project. Um, so Ryan Schmidt has been a research scientist with ICDISIS Foundation since 2018. I hope I read the ICDISIS or ICDISIS correctly, but you can, <laughs> you can correct me later. Uh, he credits his upbringing on a family farm for honing his interest to work with farmers and ranchers to develop uh, practical solutions to their problems. When not building roller crimpers, his time is spent investigating services provided um, by the arthropods in agroecosystems. Uh, so let's invite uh, Ryan for his presentation. He's the second, our second speaker this morning. All right, thank you. Uh, happy to be here this morning. Um, yeah, I'm gonna be talking about a roller crimper build that we did with some local farmers in our area. So just to start off with, I'd like to get a little bit info. How many people are familiar with what a roller crimper is and what it's supposed to be doing? Okay, all right. Quite a few hands, but not everyone. So maybe we'll go over some of the basics here. Um, so, in our area, I work with a lot of big commodity producers, a lot of corn soy producers, a lot of cattle producers as well. And we, we like to have a coffee club with some of the local folks in the area. And one of the th issues they have every spring is they like planting cover crops into their fields for the soil health benefits, like this field you see here. And a lot of times they, they'll plant cereal rye, that's the big one right now, uh, that works really well in the corn soy systems. And they can plant in uh, green into that is what they call it. They're planting their soybeans green into that rye. And then typically to deal with that rye, they don't want it competing with their cover, uh, their cover crop of rye competing with their cash crop. Uh, they have a couple of different methods. Uh, if they're non-organic, a lot of times they like to use a burn down application of herbicides. Uh, after they have their their uh, Roundup Ready soybeans planted in there. Or if they're some of the organic producers that we work with, they'll typically till up the field and then plant their, their soybeans into that. So those are the two methods, the, uh, but there's, you know, the, the conventional guys that are into cover crops, they want to reduce their herbicides as much as possible. They don't like messing with that stuff uh, for, for various reasons from health health reasons to they just don't like it. Uh, they they want to reduce their herbicide patches to reduce their fuel costs. Uh, the tillage guys know what they're doing to their soil by tilling it up, but they don't have much of an option since they're organic folks. So uh, they started tossing around this idea. They've seen a lot of research out there on roller crimping, and they are wondering, could we do that in our area? And so we said, we think you can, but it's going to cost you about thirty to 35000 bucks to get a roller crimper. And uh, they kind of got quiet because that's, that's a big investment for something that they're unsure about. Uh, and, and so we're like, we were sitting around the table having coffee, and we said, it's not that complicated of a machine. We think we have the expertise to do this. So... Uh, we, we decided we're going to build a roller crimper for these folks uh, with their help. So we called around and we said, this is our basic frame uh, that we're going to use for our, our equipment. We, we went out and we found just an old salvage disc. A uh, little tip, if you're thinking about doing this on your own place, anything below 30 foot, a dealership in our area doesn't want to touch. So they typically sit in tree lines right now, and the farmer will sell it to you for 1000 2000 bucks. Uh, so they're quite a bit cheaper. Uh, the reason being, no conventional farmer nowadays has anything less than a 30-foot disc, so they have no trade-in value. So we could find those really cheap, and we picked this one up right here, and we wanted to turn it into something like that. And to do that, 
Uh, we did a little bit of planning, like I said. I am, uh, I research insects, so I have no idea what I'm doing with a lot of this stuff. So we just started spitballing ideas. And we we're lucky our partnership um, grant, uh, the farmers that were on that grant, were uh, uh, experts at, actually one was a machinist, professional machinist, another one was a professional welder, and then the other one taught at SDSU, taught uh, engineering uh, and manufacturing at SDSU for a while. So they helped us come up with this schematic, and just to kind of go through, for folks that are familiar with roller crimpers, they typically have a chevron pattern, it's like a V on the drums. And the idea for this grant was that we wanted anybody to be able to build this in their farm shop. And the chevron patterns can be a little bit difficult for your typical farm shop to produce because they're, they have to curve over the drum as well as together and meet in the middle and it all has to be pretty perfect. Uh, so that's, that's something most folks can't do. So we just said, you know, we found a company up in, in Canada that was just taking steel bars and just running them across a couple feet and then alternating them like that. And the reason for that alternating pattern, if you would run that steel bar across, that's your crimping bar, all the way across, it would bounce so much it would drive you crazy as you're driving down the, down the field. So by alternating it like that, it, it reduces the bounce. At least that was the hope for us. And uh, yeah, this is kind of the, the side view of the drum here. And we went with a 16 inch outside diameter drum because we stole that from the manufacturers as well. So no reason to overthink it. If somebody else has done it and done it well, uh, and uh, we'll take their good ideas every day. So I don't have time to go over all the specifics. We're gonna have a video series coming out here in January with uh, uh, how-to video of how, if you want to, you can build this yourself, along with the plans for it as well, with all the accurate measurements and whatnot. So that'll be coming later, but I'll just give you guys a brief overview, and if you have questions, you can, you can talk to me uh, later. But first thing is, get your supplies. Like I said, we went with the 30-foot. This is an international 490, pretty common in our area. Uh, really easy to find and really cheap. Take off the disc gangs and find yourself some roller drums. These are salvage ones from the oil fields out in North Dakota. And they just were at a salvage yard right next to us, 20 miles down the road. Uh, and they are pretty, pretty easy to find, really cheap. Uh, and then, oh, I should mention, on those drums, you got you to gotta weld your crimper blades. And rather than find those salvage, it was easier to go to a, a Max Steel, which is up the road from us in Watertown. Uh, and they just had all the supplies there we needed for about the same price as a salvage yard. So we just got it from there and they cut it up for us. That saves you an immense amount of time if you're gonna be doing this yourself. If somebody has a laser cutter and can do it for you cheap, do that. So next you put it on. And just to prepare you, if you're going with our method here, these are the steel bars that we melt, weld on instead of a chevron steel bar pattern. You better be prepared for a lot of welding. Uh, stick welding, you can do it, uh, but you're gonna go through a lot of sticks, so I'd recommend a wire feed welder. And it, we kind of coach folks through uh, on the measurements and how to make sure that everything's accurate on those drums there in our video series, so we won't go over that today. Uh, next was just mounting those drums right here. Here's one of our completed drums onto our disc frame. And we have our supervisor cat right there. Um, and this is, this is Al Evenson. He was, he was the professional welder and kind of coached us through a lot of this stuff. This is Mike Bredesen. He was the other scientist that helped me with this. And we just took an old, um, another salvage piece of equipment that was in the tree line. This is the toolbar off of an international planner. And we made up these brackets and kind of used that as a yoke to set over the wings of our, our uh, uh, wing of the, uh, the disc right there. So uh, that's the trickiest part, uh, but we were able to figure it out. Uh, Mike and I have no shop experience at all, so if we can figure it out, you guys can, can definitely figure it out then. Uh, you're much, much handier than we are at this kind of stuff. So we got it on there. And then it was time to test it out. So we took it to another 
farmer that was partnering with us today and, uh, and on this project, excuse me, and he, uh, we tested it out on a field. He had a field of volunteer rye come up, so it wasn't a great spot to test, but we just wanted to make sure the thing didn't rattle itself to pieces and fall apart. So here it is out in the field, uh, and you can see here it's rolling pretty smooth along, uh, and, and we were pretty happy. Nothing fell off. They were happy. The only issue is with this kind of design, I'll say, if you don't have a thick stand of rye, which this gentleman didn't, uh, it will get some mud if it's wet. It'll get some mud packed in there. And there are some workarounds to that that we've figured out. So in the future, we would do some modifications to it so that there would be less chance to get mud into it. Uh, and this is a nice stand of rye we had with another cooperating farmer. Uh, and it pulled much better. We didn't have the mud issues in this field because he had a thick stand of rye, and it crimped it really nicely. So we were really happy. The farmer was also really happy. We also had some folks that said they wanted to use it on their weeds. Uh, it crimped down thistles in a big thistle patch in a field for us, and uh, I took it out because I wanted to test it out too one day and get rid of these ragweeds that were behind the lab. So and those are still falling down, or they're still knocked down. So it did a good job of that too. Uh, and just to show you here, it does crimp quite nicely. Uh, we got a crimp here on the same plant there. It's about every 12, 13 inches it crimped. It's supposed to be every seven inches, but I think that was a weight issue, and we resolved that now we can add more weight to it so that it can crimp better. Uh, and just to show you, the, the main purpose of this is we're kind of cheap, so we wanted to build this for less than $30,000. Right now, in materials, is 5000 I still have a couple bills that are out there, so it'll be about 6000 when it's all done, uh, which is considerably cheaper. I just looked up a professionally built one. It's about 32000 right now for something really similar. And if you didn't want to build it yourself, the, the machinist and the weld shop said they could build it if we could get the supplies for about 6000 bucks. So if you didn't want to do the work and you just got the supplies together, you could have this put together for you for 11000 total. And I should mention that this was a partnership grant with SARE, and it was definitely a community project. We had a lot of folks come and help and work on this. And believe me, Mike and I have never welded in our lives. We've never taken a machine class at all. So if we, we did a lot of the welding and a lot of the work on it. We just needed some coaching and some expertise from our farmer partners, and they did some of the dangerous stuff for us, like Seth right here. Uh, so if we can do it, anybody can do it, but they were a huge help. So if anyone has any questions or, or, or anything like that, they can email me or just get a hold of me at the conference. Thanks. Can you talk about importance of building relationships for these projects? Uh, yeah, uh, our, to, in short, our project wouldn't have happened if we didn't have relationships. It came from having a coffee club with our farmers just to chat and find out where they're at with things and what's important to them. And, uh, and that's what it built into uh, was, a, was a huge project as well as the project just wouldn't have gotten done. We did not have the expertise to pull this off, so we relied heavily on our relationships with the farmers in the area to gather supplies and do all the work. What advice would you have for somebody who's interested in applying for a grant? Uh, especially on the SARE grants, I know Beth Nelson at a University of Minnesota is really in charge of a lot of that, and I'd say she's helped me a lot as we were getting through the application process as far as what reviewers might be looking for. Uh, you know, is this project meet uh, the, what the, the criteria that the grant is designed for as well? Uh, she, was, she was a big help. 